a bombshell as she addressed a judge this afternoon concerning her conservatorship. For 13 years, the court has given her father, Jamie, control over much of the pop star's life and money. Now Britney calls that conservatorship, quote, abusive and says she wants her life back. Let's go right to ABC News contributor Chris Connolly, who's been following this for us. Chris, Britney is not mincing words here. Very much so, yeah. You, I deserve to have a life, I think, is the sentence that stuck in my mind. And the words came out so fast that in some cases the judge had to ask her to slow down so the court reporter could get them all in. She spoke for more than 20 minutes, and while she remained composed throughout, you could hear in her voice a torrent of emotions and words describing the agonies that she's felt over the last 13 years. And she came after everybody, her conservators, the conservatorship, her parents, her family, her managers, her handlers, her therapists. It was a Britney Spears we've never heard before. And it's one uh, whose words will resonate for many months afterwards as we got for the first time a, a real sense as to what she's actually been feeling, what she's actually been going through during these last years of conservatorship. She wants her life back in no uncertain terms. And the voice and the words that she shared with us were dramatic in the extreme. And I heard you say the word actually a few times there, what she's actually been feeling, because it wasn't that long ago. Brittany got on Instagram addressing her fans, and she told everyone, I'm okay, I'm happy. And here today in court, she told the judge, you know, I said that, but I didn't mean that. I'm not okay, I'm not happy, I'm traumatized. You're absolutely correct, and I think she said, in part, she felt she said she had to say those things because she felt people might not believe her. I think people are going to believe her now. I think the power of her emotion is really going to resonate. Certainly for the, the people who have been the supporters of the Free Britney movement, this is exactly what they anticipated she might say and what they felt was going on. And for anybody who has a rooting interest for Britney Spears, who's loved her music, it's a, it's a chilling moment. It really is. And, and uh, you stress the word believe there. I want to bring in... Uh, ABC News legal contributor Shauna Lloyd for that because Shauna for us listening and I'm sure for Britney fans around the world this is really compelling testimony but the court has a lot to factor in in listening to someone who is currently under a conservativeship testify on her own behalf so walk us through what the court has to take into account here. The court is going to have to take a lot more than just what Ms. Spears is saying at this current moment into evaluation to determine if this conservatorship should end. They are going to look for an evaluation. And I know that there were things she said where she didn't want to be evaluated again. But a judge is going to look for an objective standard to determine her competency. Her words alone will be impactful, and I think it will make him mindful. But that will not be the end all in determining whether or not this conservatorship should end. And Shauna, we're now hearing that Mr. Spears' lawyer, Jamie Spears' lawyer, uh, read a statement in court saying that uh, Jamie Spears is sorry to hear his daughter is in so much pain. Mr. Spears loves his daughter and misses her very much. How do you expect this all to play out now that we've heard this from Brittany directly? I think what you're going to see is the court is going to be very careful. Obviously, the conservatorship is not meant to be a situation in which someone is imprisoned. It's meant to help them facilitate their return into being able to manage their own funds and their own lives. So the purpose is to help facilitate them getting better. If this is, in fact, something that as a judge looks into it is not helping her, then it will be reevaluated. And there's many portions of it that can be reevaluated. Portions of the conservatorship can be given back back to her, and some of it may remain intact. A lot of that is going to depend on the experts that testify as to where they feel she is with her mental health issues. And Chris, the court took a quick break after Brittany's testimony. They're coming back now. How do How's the rest of the day expected to play out with this hearing? I'm sure there'll be continued conversations and things like that, but I think the things that people wanted to hear, they've really heard now. I mean, let's face it. The essence of pop music is that it validates the emotion and feelings of young people, emotions and feelings that get belittled and ignored by adults, especially parents. And Britney's music made people feel like they could live full emotional lives, that they weren't just daughters and sons. So for Britney herself in her 40th year to have to beseech the court not to belittle, not to ignore her 
her own feelings and emotions. It's a heartbreaking moment. And Shauna, she's detailing things like what she says being forced to work. I think at one point she even referred to herself as feeling like a slave. She says that she was forced to do work she didn't want to do and that when she tried to push back on anything, including taking on just one move of choreography that she didn't think they should do, that she was reprimanded for that. Does this sound like the normal terms of a conservatorship? Absolutely not. None of those things detail something that should be happening in a conservatorship. And I think what you might see is the judge looking really heavily with a fine tooth comb as to how this has been proceeding and the impacts on her life. It's also going to be filtered through the lens of where she is with her mental status. You know, it's very different if someone is saying that from a healthy standpoint or if they're saying that from some other standpoint that isn't as healthy mentally. So all of that is going to factor into how we see the judge moving forward on this particular case. Uh, Chris, how do you see this moving forward for Brittany herself? She's gotten up in court and said something that it seems like from her demeanor today, she's been wanting to say for a long time and finally worked up the courage to do it. Uh, but, you know, a lot of people have been asking, what's next for her? Will she perform again? Will she not? How do you think this all impacts her future? I think we've seen pop stars recently, Taylor Swift comes to mind, understanding how much power they really have when they call upon their fans and the people who love their music and they speak their truth. Britney has never really done this. Britney has not really utilized the power she might have had. Britney's not always had maybe the best relationship to power or to be able to affect her situation. This is a watershed moment. This is going to change the way people feel about Britney and her conservatorship. She's never talked like this before. And so whatever happens inside the courtroom with the conservatorship, Conservatorship, the dynamic outside the courtroom in terms of people who love Britney, love her music, and feel that 13 years is more than enough. As Britney says, I'm not just good at what I do, I'm great at what I do. And a lot of people agree with her on that and think, as she says, it's time for me to have a life. And the judge apparently just said, I would encourage Ms. Montgomery, along with other professionals, to really hear what Mrs. Spears is saying, because, you know, part of the goal of this therapy is to help. And the way it's being presented, it is not you know, accomplishing that and the best way uh, that it could be. So it seems like the judge at least has been receptive uh, to what Britney Spears has said so far. But Chris, you touched on something that seems to have kind of a broader implication here, particularly in the times that we live in now with social media so prevalent. It's interesting what we've seen this Free Britney movement started with just a few Britney fans who don't know her personally, who aren't connected to her directly in any way, raising questions and rallying behind her and questioning this conservatorship. And for a long time, people wondered, you know, do these people really have any idea what's going on behind closed doors. And it sounds like from what we heard from Britney today, in many cases, the case they have been making by dissecting her social media and other things like that has been vindicated. And I wonder how much of what Britney said today in court is due to the strength that she got from her fan base and what that means for the relationship between fans and stars going forward. Yeah, those are all good questions. I mean, she certainly delineated in grand, in granular tones, in some cases, in enormous detail, the objection she had to the way she was being treated in terms of therapeutically, in terms of being able to do her job, in terms of her relationship with her family and stuff. It is really ironic that in this era of social media, where anyone can pick up the phone and have a microphone to speak to the universe on social media, that this is the first way in which we hear Britney's real story, not through through social media, not through anything she says, but through our listening to her speak into a court. It's, it's quite remarkable. And as you say, there's a lot in what she said that vindicates the feelings of the Free Britney movement. And I think the idea that Britney deserves some of the uh, independence that she called for, it, that, that call is going to resonate uh, in a lot of places in the weeks and months to come. All right, and it sounds like the judge in the case is now looking to schedule future proceedings so they can figure out exactly where to go from here. But again, she encouraged the parties involved to really listen to what Britney Spears said today. So one way or the other, Britney Spears was heard today in court, not only by the judge and the parties involved, but by the world. And you can bet her fans were listening. Chana Lloyd, Chris Connolly, great to have you both. Thank you. And that does it for us here today. You can see a full wrap-up tonight on ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis at 7 p.m. Eastern. I'm Diane Macedo. Thanks for joining us, and have a great evening. Stay safe.
tell all our patients how much they are loved to hold their hands. David, we're showing our love and support for all the ICU staff. They're the heroes in this. <laughs> Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. This is GMA3, what you need to know. GMA3. A third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon. It's all about you. Lunchtime on ABC. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Friday nights, 9, 8 central, true crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable, follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020, Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime, Nightline. All right, welcome back to GMA3. Dr. Ashton, where do we even start with this topic? Cannabis use up. Oh. Big headline research done out of the NIH because they're looking at two concerning trends, or potentially at least one concerning trend for sure, which is the increasing rate of major depression and suicide, particularly amongst young people, and the rate of cannabis use, which has more than doubled in the last 20 years. So they did a survey, they looked at almost 300,000 people, basically four groups, those who never used cannabis, those who did not use it on a daily basis, those who did use it on a daily basis, and those who qualified for really cannabis use disorder. Mm -hmm. And then, based on survey, they found out how many suffered major depression, how many were having thoughts of self-harm or suicide. And what they found, and I want to emphasize, this is an observation, this is an association, they are not saying this is cause and effect, is a significant increase in the link between those young adults who were heavy users of cannabis or even at all users of cannabis and their risk of major depression. 3% of people in this survey without major depression did not use cannabis, had suicidal ideation. So 3%, we're gonna see that unfortunately in the general population. Compare that to 7% of people who did use cannabis, who had thoughts of suicide. 9% of cannabis users, daily cannabis users, had thoughts of suicide and major depression. So they are looking at this like an awareness, just awareness. Be aware that both of these things can coexist and again, possibly a target for intervention. And, and you say not a cause and effect because it could be that people who feel that way are drawn to using cannabis. That's correct. So a lot more research needs to be done. But again, the awareness here is very important. And speaking to that, Jen, we want to remind viewers, if you or a loved one are struggling, you can please call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. We'll be right back. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. 
Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for Overall Excellence in Television. ABC News, America's number one news source. There once was a housewife. Erica Jane. A real housewife of Beverly Hills. Who married a hustler. Tom Girardi was L.A. Law. So powerful. They were just blowing money left and right. But then... The Real Housewives star accused with her husband of staging a fake divorce. Thomas Girardi accused of embezzlement. People love a good scandal. The biggest question is, did she know? The Housewife and the Hustler. Only on Hulu. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast, 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights, The View, the number one daytime talk show, and ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. Welcome back to GMA3, what you need to know. Sound of the Times, <laughs> got a little birthday party here going on underground. This is a tribute to Oscar winner, acting legend Meryl Streep. You see, she has a 72nd birthday. Well, she got a cake, I'm sure, but look what the New York City artist did for her <laughs> at the 72nd Street Station. It's the 72nd Street Tree. Station. <laughs> As of now, I put the emphasis on the P just to get it across. But, uh, but happy birthday to Meryl Street. That's happy birthday. Right. That's just a few blocks, well, what, 30 blocks up from yeah. where we are about? Look at you doing math. <laughs> <laughs> It's a, why do you have a dance for everything? <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's turn now to a headline we saw in the Atlantic recently. Caught our attention here. Look at this. It reads, the ugly side of NBA fandom can no longer be ignored. Further stating what it says is, quote, a problem that athletes know all too well. The communal passion of fans is tipping into venom and vitriol. That's right. So today we assembled a panel of experts to explore this idea further. And joining us now is our very own chief medical correspondent, Dr. Jen Ashton, along with professor of psychology at Murray State University, Dr. Daniel Wan, and ESPN Sports Center anchors L. Duncan and Kevin Nagandi. Thank you all for being with us this afternoon. We appreciate it. L, I want to actually start with you and go back mm -hmm. to 2004, yeah. uh, where there was a real watershed moment, the malice at the palace, a brawl broke out between players and spectators, and a lot of people said that that was, like I said, a, a watershed moment, a tipping point. Yep. Are we at another one of those moments in history? It feels like that. You know, the mouse at the palace coincidentally started with someone throwing a diet soda, right? Like, that's as simple as it was, and it, it had so many ripple and after effects from banning alcohol sales in the fourth quarter. There was such a fallout. I feel like back then, to see players and fans fighting it, it was this sort of visceral reaction and now we've gotten to this point where because of social media we're watching people fight all the time right like we're constantly seeing fan interaction and fan fighting and I think that we've gotten to a point now where sports has this beautiful mix that can sometimes turn quite dangerous and that is a sense of entitlement these people pay their money and they feel like because
because I paid money, I am going to watch you do whatever I want. I can say to you whatever I want. You are my circus clown and you will do what I want. You combine that with this sort of tribalism that comes along with being a sports fan. And then of course the pack mentality. I have watched grandmas who I know to be Bible school teachers cussing athletes up and down because once they are sort of in these heightened environments, it causes for some people destruction and violence. But Kevin, she, she mentions there the sense of entitlement in the, in the stadium, but it also feels like Twitter in the arena oh. because you can almost hide behind and do whatever you want to do and say whatever, whatever you want to say. You are not going to say that to a 6'8", 250-pound dude walking down the street. So what makes them so comfortable in that arena? There's no consequence, right? And think about this. For 15 months on social media, they could say whatever they want yeah. and there's no consequence and as Elle has brought up the DMs you could slide into somebody's DMs with nothing no repercussions whatsoever I think when you look at this specifically too it is a tipping point now because for 15 months you've been indoors mm -hmm. and suddenly you're surrounded by thousands of people and you have alcohol mixing into this and suddenly you could say and feel like you could do whatever you want with that pack mentality with the crowd cheering you on but i also think that part of this is coming out of a pandemic so dr juan i want to bring you in here uh, you have literally written the book on fan psychology and obviously the mental health aspect of this you say that there are both situational and personal contributing factors in this aggression what does that mean explain that yeah, so when I talk to my students in my classes, often what I'll tell them is that the one great truth of psychology is if you want to understand people, if you want to know why people do what they do and feel what they feel and, and think what they think, you're going to have to both consider the person, who they are, and the situation, where they are. And sports fan aggression, it's no different. If we're going to try and figure out why fans do these things, they, they act out, they act violently, we've got to look at who the fan is and then also look at where the fan is. From the perspective of who the fan is, one of the key factors is what we call team identification. That's simply the fan's psychological connection to his or her team. How much is being a fan of that team a central part of their identity? Well, if you're a highly identified fan, that is, being a fan of this team is really who you are, when the team loses, the team didn't just lose, you feel like you lost. When a ref makes a bad call against the team, you feel like the ref made a bad call against you. The losses mean so much to you that you're more likely to act in a violent and upsetting manner when you watch the team defeated or, or have some type of judgment or bias call against them. When we look at the situation, one of the key factors that's been already mentioned by the panel is the notion of the fact that when fans are at these games, they often feel anonymous. They feel like no one's going to know what they do. They can kind of hide in the crowd or have this mob mentality. It's kind of funny because all of the other fans around them have cameras because they have cell phones, but still they have this sense that they're anonymous and no one's really going to know what I do. So I might do things. Otherwise, I wouldn't try if I could be singled out. Yeah, and Kevin, interestingly, you were just referencing that anonymity, especially when people are on social media. They definitely feel like they can hide behind their Twitter handle. But when you're in a crowd, it seems counterintuitive that you would somehow think you had that anonymity still on you. So when you're looking at how to prevent it, how to stop this from happening again, what what are the options? What what do teams do? What what does security do? How do we prevent this? Lifetime bans, not indefinite bans. To me, if, if you do something like this, don't ever come back back inside the arena. And we've seen some teams respond that way, but with indefinite bans, right, to, at Madison Square Garden, Wells Fargo Center. To me, also, pressing charges. And, and it's not, don't just put this on the players specifically. The team, the organization, as well as the facility should be allowed to be in a position to press charges. I watch these incidents and I get nervous. I'm scared to death that a player at some point, the wrong player, are having the wrong day. Yep. What if a player retaliates? What happens if there's somebody else goes into the stand? Because we remember what that, that storyline was sure. about this majority black league, sure. these black players going, it was all thug this and, yeah, thugs, that and yeah. all this. What happens and how close are we to, to at some point, the wrong player is going to say, uh-uh. The level of restraint that we have seen from, yes. uh, we're talking a lot about NBA because that's the season that we're in, but the level of restraint, Trey Young getting spit on at MSG, uh. right? Kyrie Irving, we just showed it, getting the bottle thrown at him in Boston. But we saw what happened, you know? The fallout is for Ron Artest, formerly known, Ron Artest lost $5 million. There was sanctions. Everything was changed. They implemented a dress code. They painted the NBA players as thugs who were unable to show uh, any kind of restraint. We do want to remember that there are so many positives. Mm -hmm. just 
access to going and watching a sport, and it's a privilege to be a fan uh, at sports at any level, by the way. Youth to pro. Yeah. So hopefully we can just remember I'm glad that. you said privilege, too, because I think people who spend the money think they can do whatever they want. Sure. It is a privilege, yeah, no doubt right. about it. Yeah. And an important one. Yes. Let's, let's not get it twisted. We need fans in the yeah. stands, and the players wouldn't have it any other way. Yeah. With all this animosity that is currently brewing, you could ask any one of them. They still would prefer to have fans yeah. in the stands than not, because it is a symbiotic relationship and rely on each other. So don't let a few apples spoil the entire yeah. bunch. All right, and it's game night, right? We got a game tonight. <laughs> go Hawks. Oh, go Hawks. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Philly. Oh, exactly. sorry. I'm so sorry. What about the Stanley <laughs> Cup? What about the Stanley Cup? Well, the Stanley Cup as well, but I've had to hear about our little rivalry with Miss <laughs> Hawk and Mr. Six. <laughs> 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 right. Guys, it's really good to have you all so here. Great. Thanks with for us. having us. Well, thank you. Kevin, yeah. Dr. Wan, thank you all so much. Uh, hopefully we won't have to have you, but we won't see any incidents uh, yeah. anytime soon to have to discuss this, but thank you so much. We appreciate your time and your insight. All right, still ahead here <laughs> on GMA3, Tori Johnson is joining us with some deals and steals when it comes to summer beauty refreshers. Also, she's a fan favorite on Tyler Perry's Sisters. A little mignon magic right here on GMA3. <laughs> when we come back, folks, well, stay with us. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart they did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not replace us! Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. Now, as the country reopens with so much hope for a brighter summer, it's time to rise and shine. And we're celebrating by hitting the road. Let's, Let's do it. Traveling to all 50 states it's this summer. It's time to rise and shine. Let us shine. Let us shine. Yes, it's time to celebrate this summer with... It's ABC's Good Morning America's Great Rise and Shine Tour. Good morning, America. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America. America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. ABC News, honored, winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Welcome back, everyone. Yes, it's time for Deals and Steals, where we partner with companies to bring our viewers incredible savings. And the one and only Tori Johnson is here with products to help you refresh your summer beauty routine from head to toe. So let's check in with Tori Johnson for more about all of these bargains. First up, wow, something to smell good. 
Finchberry, that's right, Amy. These are all handcrafted in their Northern Florida studio. You get a lush lather, a gorgeous, just visually beautiful mm. soap, and something that smells really good too. Kind of it checks all the boxes, and it's a bonus that you're also supporting a small business. We've got singles and sets in their handcrafted soaps. We also have their salt soaks and their solid perfume. Everything from Finchberry is beautiful, and today is a good day because it's all slash in half it starts at five dollars smells amazing and we saw dr jen just stealing one she uh okay told me about these <laughs> products and apparently the one i'm holding here is like the best ever uh, according to Dr. Jen, Ahava Skin Care, it's, it's got a really strong fan base, and I was delighted that during a commercial break, Dr. Jen was telling me that it is one of her favorite brands. There are a couple of products that she singled out. They're best known for their 24 karat gold mineral mud mask. It's great for just moisturizing skin, giving a little more radiance and glow. I believe, though, there's a facial serum that is uh, the one that she singled out. You've got it in your hand, Amy, which is the one that Dr. Jen loves. Yes, right here, right here. So everyone, everyone take note of that. Also, okay, so take we've notes. got some hair care products. Oh, the price, and the price, sorry, I jumped ahead. We do have we hair care. Tell people I, the, the price deal. on those, all 50% off, they start at $16. So good day, to, good day to try the line or to stock up on your favorites. Then, as you said, yes, we've got hair care. This is all specifically for color-treated hair from True Hair. We've got a few different things from them. They're best known for their root cover-up. So if you're traveling or if you're between salon visits in 10 seconds it will cover any of the growth it's for all colored uh, all colors of hair and um, easy and safe for color treated hair we've got their shampoos conditioners a lot of their great treatments we even have a really fun um, pink dusting that if you're looking for a little flair for your hair lots of good things from this line all 50% off starts at six dollars all right TJ he's been shaking his head at me because I screwed that up and he's been laughing at me so you do better you do better. Oh, I, was, I was laughing at other stuff, actually, Robes. <laughs> um, uh, Tori, I'll have you know, we already had Vernon, one of our managers here, in my ear saying, grab me one of those bags. So tell me what I have here. People are loving them. Okay. Vernon's going to have to duke it out with Dr. Jen because ah. she too liked these bags from Brooke. They are beloved for a, just a sophisticated look for everyday adventures. Whether you're going away for the weekend or you're going to the gym or to work, the bags are durable. We've got three different materials. Canvas, vegan leather, genuine leather. The vegan leather weekenders, our deal's $45. I mean, these prices are unbelievable and they're just, they're gorgeous and you would not believe the price. That you, got a, you get a lot of beauty from for your buck on these. They start at $12 for the little kits. And then um, we go to Earthwood, yep. um, TJ. Yep. These are sunglasses as well as watches that are all made from reclaimed or recycled wood and all recycled materials. They look beautiful on, but then they also have that eco vibe, which is great. They're 60% off, starting at $25 and from Earthwood free shipping. And I got a rush to the end. The last one is Aramish. This is a really sweet business in Joplin, Missouri, started by two sisters, and they're all about the arm party. Um, lots of stacks, so you can wear them all at once, you can wear them individually, you can share them with friends. They're great also to send to campers, loved by all ages, and we've got their brand new baseball collection. So if you wanna uh, show some pride for your favorite team, this is a great line. They also have anklet stacks, which I think are really fun for summer. Everything is 50% off, so the stacks start at $12, and TJ and Amy, those are your GMA3 deals. All right, you know I love my anklets. All right, Tori, thank you so much. We've partnered with all of these amazing companies on these great deals to get yours. You can go to our website for all the best. Tori, you are the best. Thank you so much. And just ahead here on GMA3 is Star Sista on the hit BET comedy drama. Yeah, Min Young is here with a peek behind the scenes for us. Stay with us. We are right back. guide you through it all tonight. We have made it through another week together. Give me a big hug, Richard. We taught all our patients how much they are loved to hold their hands. David, we're showing our love and support for all the ICU staff. They're the heroes in this. <laughs>
Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for Overall Excellence in Television. ABC News, America's number one news source. This is GMA3, what you need to know. GMA3. A third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon. It's all about you. Lunchtime on ABC. New details coming in about Ghislaine Maxwell. She's an accused sex trafficker awaiting trial for her life. Ghislaine has denied the allegations. It's a fairy tale the wrong way around. The princess starts life in a palace and she ends up in a kind of dungeon. Now, the new exclusive. I do believe that she is innocent of these charges. Is it possible on any level that you just don't know your sister that well? Notorious Ghislaine Maxwell, Friday night on ABC. <laughs> The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not replace us! Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Friday nights, 9, 8 central, true crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable, follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020, Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime, Nightline. Well, apparently Andy has some photo shoot. Okay. Oh yeah, she told me about that. Karen, do you know about it? This reminds me of so. Yes, y'all holding out on it. She just told me today, okay? So it is legit. Well, why'd he call you? And what the hell is he up to? Well, he called me to ask y'all to come and support her tonight because she's gonna be nervous. This is strange. Yeah, I know. Like, Andy loves taking thirst trap photos. Oh, yeah. She loves photo shoots. She do like taking pictures. Half naked. Yeah, she did that plenty before him, which is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> that was a scene from BET's hit comedy drama, Tyler Perry's Sisters, where we each week meet the ladies who are mixing things up, and the best part is you never know what's coming next. <laughs> That's just what fans say makes the show so Awesome. And one of the stars of that show quickly becoming a household name, Mignon. Hey, Mignon, <laughs> how are you doing today? It's good to see you. I'm good. How are you? Thank you for having me. We are doing great. Are you all having as much fun behind the scenes as you appear to be having uh, when we see the actual show? Yeah, we really are. It's, I mean, COVID shooting is stressful, but... Um, we, we're honestly, we're a good mix. We're a group, a good group, lightning struck, and we have a lot of fun. <laughs> That's what's that's what makes it magical. I know you play Danny and you're the the friend that mm -hmm. everyone needs in their life, basically. And I'm just curious, is that you in real life? Of course it is, right? <laughs> <laughs> I like I don't I do not want to be as involved in people's drama as um, Danny is, only because like her friends don't listen to her. Like if my friends listen to me, uh, if like I, I actually have a good group of friends, like when they have things that they're working on and trying to figure out, like they take sound advice. But I'm telling you, all of these women are so thick skulled, Danny included. So, <laughs> but I mean, am I there for my friends? Yeah, but I mean, I would not want to be as 
drama fight in there. Okay. <laughs> I know you're there for your friends. You sound so much. I go through this with, with Robach here, my co-anchor, in that we know when certain things are going on, she is not the one to call. She's not the hugger. She's not, right? She's, that sounds oh, kind of like... stop it some more, TJ. Are, are, you're are making you, me feel all warm and fuzzy. Mignon, that's not you, though. That's not what you're saying. You're still there for your friends, right? There for my friends. No, I'm not like rub your back. Oh, oh. honey, I'm, I'm not that. I, I could, I could be more gentle probably, but I don't think I'm too rough. I mean, I'm not like as gentle as sandpaper, but um, I mean, you know, I. I care. Oh, hey, hey, Mignon, oh, Mignon, Mignon I you care. and I, now we could be friends. I think we speak each other's language. I appreciate that. <laughs> you hear that, TJ? Thank you. Well, you all really could be friends. I mean, we're, we, we know the blondes have more fun. Uh -huh. We both know that, too. So, Mignon, uh -huh. thank you very <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for being with us. want to let everyone know you can see all new episodes of Tyler Perry's Sisters every Wednesday on BET. <laughs> that was so great, Mignon. <laughs> thank you so much. We'll hope to see her down the road. Ashton, you walked here. right into it. Okay, final thoughts today, you guys. Um, behavioral health, we're continuing this trend this week. We're doing kind of a series on how to make good habits. I'm giving you three at the end of every show. Today, the three are the following. Number one, you want to make a new habit of something? Pace yourself. You don't have to go all out. It's often a marathon, not a sprint, so take your time. Number two, it's also important to identify how not, you know, the bad habits. So identify the triggers, things that trip you up, kind of damage control before you get started. And number three, be proactive. Don't wait for this change to come to you. Go out and get it. And that's what you're doing with your well, trip. And I'm just you. so proud of you. I'm so excited <laughs> for you. you. And have a wonderful and safe time because you are doing it at high altitude. Yeah, thank you very much, you're Dr. Welcome. Jen. I safe is key. It. I, yeah, I safe is key. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we <laughs> need her to come back. Uh, <laughs> right, folks, that's what you need to know for this Wednesday. Join the conversation on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. We will be back tomorrow. I'm TJ. Yeah, TJ will be back tomorrow. So will Dr. Jen. But thank you for being with us here in our Times Square studios in New York City. Have a wonderful Wednesday, everyone. When it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. powerful stories of our time, anytime, Nightline.
Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. Do you believe The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Now, as the country reopens with so much hope for a brighter summer, it's time to rise and shine. We're traveling to all 50 states. Celebrate GMA's Rise and Shine Tour. A messy scene in our nation's capital today. A pedestrian bridge collapses onto a busy highway, leaving five people injured and snarling traffic for hours. Tonight, authorities are investigating whether a truck carrying hundreds of gallons of diesel hit the bridge. President Biden's new push to slow a nationwide rise in violent crime and gun violence. Cities will now be allowed to use COVID relief money to keep officers on the streets. Will it help? Our conversation with Oakland's police chief. We also need legislators to step up and make stronger gun laws so that we don't see these type of weapons uh, coming into our community. And we. Britney Spears tells all in court saying, I'm not here to be anyone's slave. Millions of fans watching and waiting for what comes next in the dramatic hearing over her conservatorship. The emergency meeting today investigating that rare heart condition in some vaccinated teenagers and young adults under 30. 323 confirmed cases of myocarditis out of millions of vaccinations. Health officials are now looking for a possible link. All this comes as health officials are urging younger Americans to get vaccinated as the Delta the variant continues to spread. The breaking news overseas tonight, antivirus software creator John McAfee found dead in a Spanish prison hours after a court cleared the way for his extradition to the U.S. The major win at the Supreme Court today for a high school cheerleader wrongly suspended from school because of a post on social media after she didn't make the varsity squad. Our Devin Dwyer tracking that case and the big loss for unions tonight. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. I'm not here to be anyone's slave. Those were the words today from one of the most famous people on the planet talking about pop superstar Britney Spears. Today, she told a Los Angeles County judge that she is not okay, that she feels enslaved, traumatized, exploited, and controlled. She's been under a conservatorship for the past 13 years, her father and others controlling her finances and personal affairs, and now she wants out. She went on to say that for years, she's not been heard. Now the world is listening. In her emotional plea, Brittany says, I deserve a life. I deserve the same rights as anyone. Fans lined up outside the court in support of the pop star. ABC's Kaylee Hartung reports in from Los Angeles, where Britney Spears testified today in her conservatorship hearing. Tonight, Britney Spears dropping a bombshell in court, telling a judge, ma'am, I'm not here to be anyone's slave. She's requesting the conservatorship that's controlled her life and finances for 13 years be terminated without any further psychiatric evaluation. During a 30-minute call into the virtual status hearing, Spears describing how her court-appointed conservators, as well as her family members, have exploited her life, traumatized her, and even forced her into a care facility against her will. Spears saying as she cried to her father, quote, to hurt his daughter, 100,000% he loved it. Telling the judge at one point, her therapist put her on the powerful medication lithium, making her feel drunk. But when she told her parents she was scared, she says her family did nothing. Since she stopped performing, Spears has stayed largely silent until now. Her Instagram, the only insight into her well-being over the last two years. Am I okay? Yes, I'm totally fine. But Spears saying today, I've lied and told the whole world I'm okay but it's a lie. 
And we are joined now by Kaylee Hartung outside of the courtroom. Just stunning testimony today going into this hearing. We really didn't know what to expect exactly. No, we didn't, Lindsay, but jaws were on the ground out here as we were listening into this video conference that didn't have any video of Brittany, and we weren't allowed to record anything we heard because of the judge's ruling, so here we are trying to do our best we can to share with you what she said because that statement from her, it was explosive. It was last year that, that her counsel had requested a status hearing like this in order to remove her father from his role in the conservatorship, but today, the state that's been circled on the calendar finally here, finally a chance to hear from Brittany herself, and, and we didn't know what to expect. We didn't know what specific issues she would bring up, but she made it very clear right out of the gate. She feels like this conservatorship is abusive, like it has taken over too much control of her life. You said it. She says, I deserve a life. The detail that she went into describing how scared she's been, how her family has done nothing to help her, how she's been embarrassed. It's, it was heartbreaking, quite honestly, to listen to the tone of her voice and the feelings that she can Conveyed the judge saying that she hears her. Lindsay. And that's likely one of the things that she wanted was to be heard. We also heard uh, from the lawyer for Brittany's father, Jamie. What was the response there? Yeah, right after this bombshell was dropped by Brittany, we heard from her father's attorney reading a very short statement on his behalf. He said he's sorry to hear that his daughter is in so much pain. Mr. Spears loves his daughter and misses her very much. That was all we heard from Jamie Spears' side. There was no rebuttal, no denial of anything that Brittany said, just that short, to the point apology. Now, uh, he is a co conservator along with Jody Montgomery. Jody Montgomery's counsel speaking up on behalf of the conservative saying they do disagree with some of the things that Brittany said, but said this is not the time or the place to take up those details. That will be discussed at a later date. And, and Brittany Spears has now made it very clear that she does not want to be a part of this conservatorship. So what happens next? And she doesn't want to be a part of this conservatorship, and she doesn't want any further psychiatric evaluation to be a part of the judge's determination of her future under this conservatorship. So, quite honestly, Lindsay, it's unclear what happens next. There was a lot of discussion of dates that need to be put on the calendar for the next hearing and the next and the next. It seems like this is just the beginning of a long process. This has already been 13 years of Britney Spears' life under the control of this conservatorship without her own control over her life and finances. You can only imagine. She wants this done expediently. The judge seeming to recognize uh, the, the time sensitive nature here as Brittany made her pleas. But we heard dates need to be put on the calendar for future hearings, and none of those dates were decided today. But one of the big questions that will also need to be answered as we learn of those further status hearings, Lindsay, is will these hearings be public in any way? Like we were able to listen in today, there was an argument made by the conservatorship side that these should not be public, but we'll see. And Britney Spears sounded like she wanted it to be public again, wanting to get her words out there. And Kaylee, you were also outside of the courthouse today speaking with some of Britney's loyal fans. We saw those free Britney signs. Tell us about your conversations and their reaction. Yeah, Lindsay, every one of the people here supporting Britney today, you talk to them, they will tell you a story about how Britney Spears has impacted their life. I spoke to one young man who said, I've been a fan since day one, since I was seven years old. And he said, I'm not trying to exaggerate here, but she saved my life. He described dark times in his life where listening to his music helped pull him out of those holes. And he said, she saved my life. He said, this is how I can repay that debt to her, showing her my unending support. He said, we are not leaving until she is set free. And we never expected to get a ruling from the judge today, but, but you could hear the cheers out here, Lindsay, among the Free Britney movement gathered as she demanded an end to this conservatorship. She minced no words in saying how it's made her felt and the damage that it's done to her life. The people here today to support her want her free, and, and they were so pleased to hear her stand up for herself today and tell the judge exactly how she feels. Lindsay. And the fans there saying that they are in this for the long haul. Kaylee Hartung, our thanks to you. Bombshell testimony means for Britney Spears. We're joined now by attorney Christopher Melcher of the Walter Melcher family law firm. Thank you so much, Mr. Melcher, for joining us. Help us understand this. Britney said that she wants out of this conservatorship. She even said that uh, she's been, quote, enslaved. Can she simply end it like this? 
No, she can't. Uh, it's up to the court to end it, and certainly the court is going to listen to what she had to say. Today was not the day to decide whether to terminate the conservatorship, but the, we now we know all those unanswered questions that we had before about why hasn't she asked for this to end earlier, and does she really want this or not, and how does she feel about it? That's all been answered today. It's really mind-blowing, the some of the statements that she made, but they're not binding on the court. This is a court order that was made uh, against her, and we'll have to have another hearing uh, and possibly evaluations to determine, for the court to determine whether it's going to continue the conservatorship. And, and in your best understanding of this, would you think that a psychiatric evaluation would be mandatory? Well, they can't force it on her. They can they can ask her to submit to it, and that would normally be part of the process to understand what's really going on with her. If she refuses to uh, submit to it, the court could consider that in denying the the conservatorship. But to me, these conservatorships are reserved designed for the most extreme cases, people who cannot take care of themselves. We're talking about adults that need protection. And so the half hour that the court got to hear from Brittany would give the court some idea whether she needs that level of protection or if so, what types of protection, maybe not such an extreme uh, order that she has right now. So the, the evaluation would be helpful. I don't know that it's totally necessary. She did say that she didn't want to go to Westlake Village to be evaluated because of the paparazzi. That's totally understandable, and maybe some accommodation could be made about where it occurs. But that may be the next step. And if she really wants out of it, to submit to it. But again, this is, a, this is just the start of a, of a really unfolding story. And what stood out to you the most about her testimony today? Well, one that she wanted to speak publicly because she did have the right to ask that it be closed. And, and I was hoping really for her sake that it would be closed because these are the most personal issues for her, her, her mental health questions and the conflict with her dad. And I understand we all want to know and her fans want to know what's really going on. But I was hoping that it would be done in a private setting. So that was one surprise. Another surprise was this IUD birth control device that she said she was forced to have. Now, that could be part of a conservatorship where the cons the person in control would make medical decisions for someone. So that was really surprising to hear that there was a lithium uh, administered to her that she claimed. So again, we don't know exactly what, how all this transpired, and um, but there, there are some jaw-dropping uh, uh, claims that were that we heard about today. And Brittany said that for years she hasn't been heard. Some of her fans, it was the so-called Free Brittany movement, have been warning about this. If true, is this the way that conservatorships are supposed to work? No. I mean, we, we usually don't see much attention on a conservatorship. It's usually someone who is developmentally disabled and, you know, seriously cannot take care of themselves, and they have a relative appointed, and that's the end of it. So here this is remarkable, and obviously a lot of people who love and care for her, there's a lot of attention on it. And now we're seeing the whole thing unravel where we're, we're there's fights over the fees and the compensation. Should it be Jamie? Should it be somebody else? Should there be conservatorship or not? So uh, I think the court's going to have to manage this differently and maybe change out counsel. I think even if the court believes that the conservatorship is in some way needed to protect Brittany, I do think she should have the right to decide who is in control. And she doesn't want her dad in control. And even if her dad has done a fantastic job, her right her desire should be honored in removing the dad. And, and as you mentioned earlier, we heard very little today from her father through his lawyer in court uh, as well. Uh, do you think that he'll be able to maintain control over her finances? Well, he, he might. And, and today was just a hearing to hear from Brittany. There was nothing for the court to decide, so I could understand tactically why dad, Jamie, wouldn't have said a whole lot. Now, the one thing, though, when Bessemer Trust was put in place as a co-conservator along with Jamie, Bessemer Trust would certainly go through the finances in great detail because it has a fiduciary duty. 
And if there was any financial improprieties, we would have heard about it by now. Bessemer Trust would have stepped up and said that. So at least me, I believe that there's no financial impropriety that at least Bessemer Trust has uncovered. But it really comes down to one adult controlling another. This is an adult parent controlling an adult child. And that child, Brittany, uh, should have a say in this. Christopher Melcher, we so appreciate your time and insight. Thanks. And now we turn to Washington, where today President Biden announced steps to try to stem America's rising gun violence, allowing communities to use COVID relief funds to stop the surge. With Attorney General Merrick Garland, he also announced a crackdown on law-breaking gun dealers providing federal help to local police departments. So will any of it make a difference? Here's ABC's senior White House correspondent, Mary Bruce. With crime surging around the country and under increasing pressure to act, President Biden today pledging to tackle this head on. We have an opportunity to come together now as Democrats and Republicans, as fellow Americans to fulfill the first responsibility of government on our democracy, to keep each other safe. Enough. 32 cities have seen a rise in homicides and assaults so far this year. And when you look at some of the nation's biggest cities, homicides in New York up 13.5% since last year. Los Angeles up 22%. And Houston, 24%. And as we emerge from this pandemic, with the country opening back up again, the traditional summer, summer spike may even be more pronounced than it usually would be. His plan to crack down on gun dealers who break the law, redirect billions of dollars in COVID relief funding to help local police departments and invest in community intervention programs. Republicans are trying to blame Democrats for the rise in crime, as some Democrats are now stressing their own law and order credentials. In New York, Eric Adams, a former NYPD captain, so far in first place after yesterday's mayoral primary. If we're going to turn around our economy, we have to make this city a safe city. Mary Bruce joins us now from the White House. Mary, the White House says that it still views gun control as key to addressing the spike in crime today. The president again called on Congress to step up. But how likely is that to happen? Uh, not very, Lindsay. Look, the president says he's going to continue to push Congress to pass gun reforms, but so far we have seen little to no movement on the Hill on this. And realistically, there's only so much the president can do on his own. But asked tonight if he's still hopeful that Congress will finally act, the president said, quote, I never give up hope. Lindsay. Not giving up just yet, at least. Mary Bruce reporting in from the White House. Thanks, Mary. Thank you. Now to the latest tools in what could be the future of policing as Oakland, California utilizes a de-escalation simulator to train their officers. ABC's Matt Gutman gives us an inside look. It was the encounter that launched thousands of protests last summer. A Minneapolis police officer wrapping his flashlight on George Floyd's window. Floyd is compliant, but the officer had already pulled his gun. This and many other incidents throughout the country showing a series of mistakes that Officer Mia Cooper, just out of the police academy in Oakland, is being trained to avoid. In this simulated scenario, another man is acting erratically, and he has a snapping dog. But Cooper only pulls her weapon after he grabs that machete. Drop the machete! And when he seems to comply, she immediately holsters her gun. This is all I know. It's not just, just go out there and just shoot. And threat. Officers used to train almost exclusively at gun ranges like this. But the Virtua 300 simulator offers scenarios which incorporates the officer's conduct and can yield different outcomes. Okay, get your hands up! I believe overall the, the best part about Virtua is it allows a safe and sterile training environment in order for us to put our officers in where they can train using their force option de-escalation skills as well as their officer safety tactics. Is it as big of a innovation in, in policing as the body-worn camera? I think it, that it, it, it is as far as the allowing us to give uh, consistent training to officers that we have, absolutely. The simulator is increasingly being used in police departments across the nation, from Orlando to Oakland. And some of those scenarios, like this mass shooting at a theater, seem jarringly real. 
use of force tactics and techniques are based off of case law, which case law kind of determines what's objectifiably reasonable a use of force. One of the pillars of how we determine what force we can use um, is that person's intent. Just because he has a gun and he's walking towards us doesn't exactly mean his intent is to come and shoot at us. But in Oakland, especially in light of increasing tension with police, the focus is on using it to mend frayed relations with the community. It actually made me open my eyes more because I was somebody that villainized officers. So now it's my duty to also explain that to others that don't understand what law enforcement is about. Get your hands off of her! I will Our thanks to Matt for that. And for more on this, let's bring in Oakland's police chief, LaRon Armstrong. You took part in President Biden's virtual roundtable this afternoon. Can you share any details from your talk with the president with us? Well, as I observed, I think it's important uh, to acknowledge the president's commitment to reducing gun violence uh, across the country. I think in Oakland, we have seen a huge increase in gun violence. So today's announcement for different uh, additional funds to support our initiatives to address gun violence is welcome, particularly when we talk about violence intervention and getting our street workers out on the streets doing outreach in our community. So really happy about that, as well as the tracking of firearms uh, that could continue to come into our community. And President Biden announced that $350 billion allocated to states and localities as part of the March uh, COVID rescue plan can be reallocated now to fight crime. How confident are you that you'll get all the funding that you need since it needs to be allocated to your department? Well, I think the Oakland Police Department is well positioned to apply for this funding. You know, we've been using our ceasefire strategy, which is an evidence-based strategy that includes not only law enforcement, but community as well as violence prevention workers. And so uh, I think that uh, the things that we're doing in Oakland align well uh, with the president's initiative. And I believe uh, we will be successful uh, in receiving funding to continue to support our programs. And the president, of course, also announced some measures to prevent guns. But, of course, these efforts take time. There's still plenty of guns already on the streets, as you know. Uh, what do you need today in order to make an impact at this time of rising violence? Well, we need uh, more support and resources. We need ATF staff here. Uh, we've been fortunate in the city of Oakland that we've had a strong partnership with the ATF. Uh, additional resources would do nothing but help. Uh, we also need legislators to step up and make stronger gun laws so that we don't see these type of weapons uh, coming into our community. And we need some legislation around ghost guns specifically. And it's certainly been a struggle to get bipartisan support to pass stricter gun control measures. In light of today's announcement, do you think that you'll be able to make significant headway in reducing crime in Oakland without major changes to federal gun laws? Yes, I think with the additional uh, resources that we may be able to secure as a result of the funding, I think increasing our department staffing through these resources would be tremendously helpful. Getting more street outreach and violence prevention workers into the community would be extremely helpful. And then every step uh, is, is a help. Every step towards public safety, every additional resource we can secure will help make Oakland a safer city. And lastly, Chief, what keeps you up at night with regard to your officers and, and their relationship with the community that they serve? What keeps me up is, at night is just knowing that we continue to see guns in our community and violent incidents continuing to happen, putting both our officers at risk as well as our community members. So what keeps me up at night knowing that there's a potential harm to both police officers as well as community members. And so uh, these resources, I believe, will help get guns off the streets and make our streets safer and hopefully help me rest at night. <laughs> we would like for you to get that. I'm just curious, has 2021 been much worse in, over previous years as far as violence is concerned in Oakland? Yes, so far we have 61 homicides. That's nearly a 90% increase compared to last year at this same time. So we are feeling the brunt of the increase in violence. Wow, 90% increase. All right. Thank you so much, Chief Laurent. We so appreciate you. Uh, again, Oakland's Police Chief Laurent Armstrong, thanks so much. Thank you for having me. Some unsettling news regarding the side effects of the COVID vaccines. The CDC announcing a possible risk when it comes to heart inflammation in younger people. The FDA announcing that it will move rapidly to add a new warning and will update the relevant information. This latest update is the Delta variant continues to spread and experts say low vaccination areas provide a fertile ground for the virus. ABC's Eva Pilgrim has this report. 
Tonight, a CDC panel finding a likely association between the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines and a rare, mostly mild heart inflammation in younger people, but saying the benefits of getting the vaccine still outweigh the risk. While this association is concerning, know that a choice not to get a vaccine is not a risk-free choice, and it is a choice to take a much greater risk of, of not only a suffering or being hospitalized or dying from the virus, but of getting myocarditis. The experts pointing to a greater risk of heart inflammation from the virus itself, but the FDA finalizing a new warning that will go out to health care providers and the public. Out of more than 26 million doses given to young people, the CDC confirming 323 cases of the condition after getting a vaccine, mostly in males. The good news is it's mild. It's short-lived, it appears to be self-resolving, and it's rare. 16-year-old Noah Hires was hospitalized with chest pain two days after getting the Pfizer vaccine. It went away within hours, but his doctors think the second dose may have caused temporary heart inflammation. I would definitely encourage everyone to get their children vaccinated, and I think Noah feels the same way. Yes. As far as we know, there is zero long-term effects from this, so 100% would still get the vaccine. Health officials saying vaccinating young people is the key to crushing this pandemic. Just a third of 18 to 24 year olds have been vaccinated. That age group now experiencing one of the highest rates of infection. Hospitals in Missouri are seeing it up close. We've been seeing much younger patients needing management within the hospital, um, some as young as their late teens, in their 20s, and their 30s, and unfortunately, all of those unvaccinated and very sick. The more contagious Delta variant now in at least 48 states, accounting for nearly half of all infections across parts of the West and Midwest. First Lady Jill Biden with country star Brad Paisley in Tennessee, making a push for the vaccine in the South, where they are struggling to get shots into arms. <laughs> But when she revealed the numbers, the crowd wasn't happy. Only three in ten Tennesseans are vaccinated. And, well, you're booing yourselves. <laughs> The Delta variant giving the race to vaccinate new urgency. Experts warn if the country doesn't boost vaccinations, we could face a tough winter all over again. We don't have enough population immunity to stop the spread of this virus, and we seem to have hit a wall. So when the winter hits, you're going to see more suffering and more hospitalization and more death. And because children are particularly vulnerable, because they, many haven't been vaccinated, I think they will likely suffer greatly. Eva Pilgrim joins us now. And Eva, despite the reports of possible heart inflammation caused by the vaccine, there's some positive news regarding booster shots. What's the latest that you have on that? Lindsay, a CDC working group finding that there's not yet enough evidence to support recommending booster shots, at least not now. They will continue, though, to monitor this virus to see if they are needed down the line. Lindsay? All right. Eva Pilgrim, our thanks to you. And now to a terrifying bridge collapse in Washington, D.C. A footbridge slammed into a busy freeway. This awful scene, several vehicles crushed under piles of concrete and fencing. Police say it began when a truck slammed into a pillar supporting the bridge. ABC's Rachel Scott has the latest. Tonight, authorities are investigating this terrifying scene. A pedestrian bridge collapsing onto one of the busiest highways in the nation's capital. Officials believe this truck slammed into the bridge, sending it crashing down. Drivers trapped in their cars, buried under the debris along I-295. We had a collision uh, with the bridge right here, which separated the bridge from his mooring. Um, the result of that uh, collision caused multiple cars to be involved. At least five people were rushed to the hospital. Tonight, all expected to survive. You can see some of the mangled concrete and twisted steel that has collapsed right on top of that truck. All this shutting down six lanes of traffic. Deborah Tracy works in a residential home across the street. She was just steps away from the scene when she heard the crash. I heard like a crunching, scraping sound, like nails on a chalkboard, then a boom. I'm just thanking God no one was killed. Crews now racing to clear the wreckage and inspecting nearby bridges along the highway to make sure they weren't damaged by the truck. And Rachel Scott joins us now. Rachel, when do authorities hope to have the wreckage cleared away and the highway back open again? 
Well, Lindsay, this stretch of the highway is expected to be closed until tomorrow morning. We are learning that crews are going to be working through the night to clear out the debris and the rubble. And many residents here wondering tonight whether or not this bridge was stable. The mayor saying tonight that the bridge was inspected earlier this year and that everything checked out. Lindsay. All right, Rachel Scott, our thanks to you. And when we come back, the herd of cows stampeding through a Southern California neighborhood. Yes, you heard that right. And how do you protect the people from COVID whose bodies find it difficult to make antibodies? That's tonight's vaccine watch. But first, the major Supreme Court ruling tonight about whether schools can regulate what students can say off campus. Our Devin Dwyer standing by with more on the major free speech ruling. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Admit it, these days what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. Do you the reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not replace Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News tonight. Night with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast, 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights, The View, the number one daytime talk show, and ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. Welcome back, everyone. We turn now to a major Supreme Court decision on free speech that we've been following here. The high court ruling that a Pennsylvania high school violated a former cheerleader's First Amendment rights when it suspended her from the team for a vulgar post on Snapchat sent off campus over the weekend. But the 8 to 1 decision did leave room for schools to police some off campus speech to prevent bullying or harassment. ABC's Devin Dwyer has a reaction from the Snapchatting former cheerleader on her free speech victory. She sued her school over free speech, and today she won big at the Supreme Court. I went on Twitter, and it said breaking news, and I read it, and I was like, oh, my God. And then I started, I, I was yelling. Former high school cheerleader Brandi Levy was suspended from her team in 2017 after school officials learned of a vulgar social media message she posted off campus on a weekend. I was angry. And I made a post on Snap. I said it was F school, F cheer, F softball, F everything. The year-long punishment for Brandy was struck down by lower courts, and today in an 8-1 to one decision, the Supreme Court agreed. Justice Stephen Breyer writing the school's disciplinary action violated the First Amendment. I think this is the most significant decision for young people's free speech rights in the past 50 years. And the court recognized that young people do have free speech rights and that 
they have to be protected. The Supreme Court in a landmark 1969 decision made clear students retain free speech rights on campus so long as they don't disrupt the learning environment or infringe the rights of others. But the court did not address off-campus situations. Teachers, principals, and parents nationwide have closely watched the Brandy Levy case, worried the court could severely limit schools' ability to protect students from harassment and abuse. And you would have a perpetrator's parents who would go to the school and say, you know, you don't have jurisdiction over this and you can't punish my child because this did not happen on your grant, on your campus, in your school walls. And, and that was just not right. One in three American middle or high school students say they've been victims of cyberbullying. And research shows the threat of punishment by schools is a key deterrent. Today, the Supreme Court acknowledged those facts. Just as Breyer writing, several types of off-campus behavior may call for school regulation such as bullying, threats, online cheating, and cyber hacks. It makes clear that school districts have the power and authority and it's not restricted by the First Amendment to control certain conduct outside of school. Uh, and we, uh, that's exactly what we were arguing. Can we call this a win-win? Uh, well, I'm not sure that I would call it a win-win, and it is clear that the Supreme, uh, that the school district won the important issues of being able, in the appropriate circumstances, to control student uh, expression uh, where uh, it meets the standards that the Supreme Court articulated. Justice Clarence Thomas, the only dissent in the case, writing schools historically could discipline students in circumstances like those presented here, and that the majority failed to explain why we should not apply this historical rule to this case. I hope the school sees this that, you know, they aren't the parents on the weekends. They aren't the parents in the summer. You know, that if they're going to hand out a punishment for something, that they would uh, sit down and, and think about what they're doing and, and all avenues and aspects of it before they make a harsh decision like they did in this situation. Are, are people sort of celebrating you as somebody who sort of went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the school district and won? I mean, yeah, like, they're, like most of the messages is just, like, people congratulating me that, like, I stuck up for like what happened and then so, some people just I got I got a text message like 40 minutes ago someone texted me saying congrats I'm glad you finally made the school look like a joke now 18 and in college Brandy tells us she regrets sending that vulgar snapchat but has no apologies for speaking her mind as for would-be cyber bullies looking to capitalize on the court's decision schools should be able to like control that but like there, there's always going to be those people and sometimes it like it hits people sometimes because I know for I I've gotten bullied so many times before it happens and sometimes people just don't realize that other humans have feelings and sometimes it gets to them a lot deeper than it gets to most people. Larry, what are you and Brandy going to do to celebrate tonight? Probably sleep because our phones don't stop ringing. <laughs> we have pizza. I want and, pizza. And text messages and. and yeah, I, I I don't know. I mean, we're gonna have just... a we're gonna have a pizza party. <laughs> it's gonna be a relaxation party. I can assure you. <laughs> A well-earned celebratory slice of pizza. Devin Dwyer joins us now. Devin, the court handed down several other decisions today, including one that dealt a major blow to labor unions in this country. Tell us about that. Yeah, Lindsay, in California for 45 years, state regulators have required farmers to allow union organizers to access their private property to meet with these migrant workers for part of the year during their breaks. The unions have said those meetings are critical to educating workers on their rights. The farmers, however, have been pushing back as, as this is an infringement of their property rights. And today, uh, the conservative Supreme Court majority, six to three, ruled in favor of the property owners, Lindsay, and the chief justice saying farmers have a fundamental right to exclude people from their property. And top union officials told me this will now make it much harder for them to organize a critical workforce in our country. Take a listen.
Farm workers are the hardest working uh, people and certainly essential workers. And the decision denies them the basic right to communicate about their rights on their own free time, not on the employer's time, on their own free time. I have nothing against unions, but I can tell you that today, the ability for anybody to, whether you're a homeowner or a business owner, to, to decide who cannot, can and cannot come on your property is fundamental. So, Lindsay, a big win today for big agribusiness at the court at a time when union membership in this country uh, is on the decline and as a time, uh, Lindsay, as the right to organize is under a lot of pressure nationwide. Lindsay. And, Devin, as we continue to report here on the power of police officers in this country and the rights of the accused today in another big case, the court set out some limits. Elaborate on that. Yeah, it did. In another unanimous decision, the court held today that police officers cannot enter a home without a warrant simply because they're pursuing somebody accused of a misdemeanor. This was also a case out of California involved a gentleman who was driving down the highway, playing loud music, honking his horn. The cops followed him, trailed him into his uh, garage, uh, confronted him, arrested him. Today, Justice Elena Kagan uh, Lindsay said the Fourth Amendment does allow warrantless uh, property searches and arrests in some circumstances, threat of life and property, uh, but it, it, the pursuit of a suspect over a misdemeanor crime is not one of those circumstances, and in this case, the cops erred. So some limits on police as to when they can come onto your property without a warrant, Lindsay. Devin Dwyer, our thanks to you. Thanks, Lindsay. Still ahead here on Prime, America's top general lashing out, defending how our soldiers are learning about this nation's history of racism. At least 50 fires are burning in nearly a dozen states. How bad could this fire season get? And why are women more likely to get vaccinated against COVID than men? We take a look by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day, Mariah Carey voicing support for Britney Spears. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart they did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not replace us! Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America. America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. ABC News, honored, winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. 
Welcome back, everyone. And now back to COVID in the U.S. And a surprising report by our partners at 538 finding a large gender gap in vaccination rates. Why are women more likely to get the jab than men? We explore by the numbers. Nine and a half million more women than men are vaccinated for COVID-19 in this country, according to the CDC. And while the gender disparity varies by state, the share of women who are vaccinated is nearly 10 percentage points higher on average than men. Experts aren't exactly sure why, but here are some theories. Women Women make up 55% of American adults age 65 and older. This group was given priority in the vaccine rollout, as were healthcare practitioners, who are 74% women, and child care workers, they're 95% women. There's also politics. 29% of Republicans said that they would definitely not get the vaccine compared to just 5% of Democrats, according to the Kaiser Family Foundation. Women are more likely to be Democrats or lean Democratic. And finally, some researchers say that men who can Conform to so-called traditional masculine norms. The idea that men should be tough and self-reliant could be more likely to reject the vaccine. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. Harrison Ford injured while filming Indiana Jones 5, how he's doing tonight, and why alcohol is being banned during the upcoming Olympic Games. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. guide you through it all tonight. We have made it through another week together. Give me a big hug, Richard. We tell all our patients how much they love to hold their hands. David, we're showing our love and support for all the ICU staff. They're the heroes in this. <laughs> Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. This is GMA3, what you need to know. GMA3. A third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon. It's all about you. Lunchtime on ABC. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 20. 20, Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. A renewed effort by the White House to address a spike in gun violence. Today, the department is announcing, as I just did, the major crackdown on stem the flow of guns used to commit violent crimes. President Biden outlining a strategy to curb rising gun violence, including cracking down on gun dealers who violate federal law and repurposing millions of dollars in state coronavirus relief funding toward police departments. The announcement comes amid repeated attacks from Republicans that the defund the police movement is behind a rise in violent crimes. It's impossible to ignore that these terrible trends are coming precisely as so-called progressives have decided it's time to denounce and defund 
local law enforcement. President Biden is also repeating his call for Congress to pass gun control laws amid a surge in mass shootings from Atlanta to Boulder to San Jose. We have an opportunity to come together now as Democrats and Republicans, as fellow Americans to fulfill the first responsibility of government in our democracy, to keep each other safe. Vice President Kamala Harris will visit El Paso, Texas Friday in her first trip to the U.S.-Mexico border since taking office. On Friday, she'll visit El Paso, Texas with Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. She's heading the administration's efforts to curb the influx of migrants. She's visited Guatemala and Mexico and will now visit the U.S. border. The wildfire emergency, at least 50 large fires burning in 11 states. California's fast-moving Inyo Creek fire forced residents from their homes in Colorado's Eagle County, the Sylvan Fire, destroying more than 3,000 acres now. And near Sedona, Arizona tonight, the Raphael Fire burning across 24,000 acres, that state closing four national forests. He can outrun a boulder and crack a whip, but Harrison Ford proved he gets injured like the rest of us, this time while filming Indiana Jones 5. The 78-year-old hurt his shoulder while rehearsing a fight scene. Production will continue while he recovers. The movie is set to come out in July of 2022, 41 years after the original Raiders of the Lost Ark was released. A major cattle roundup in Southern California. A herd of 34 cows stampeded through a neighborhood in Pico Rivera, California. Police say they escaped from a nearby slaughterhouse, trampling lawns and bushes. At least one person was hurt. Authorities rounded up the herd and are looking for any remaining stragglers. With just a month until the Tokyo Olympics, another restriction, no alcohol. Fans will be cheering for their favorite athletes sober this year. No sales or consumption of the sauce. As you might have guessed, the reason for the ban is to prevent the spread of COVID. This comes after officials also said no cheering or high fives would be allowed for the reduced 10,000 fans allowed in each venue. Already a second member of Team Uganda has tested positive for the virus amid online protests to cancel the Olympics. Welcome back, everyone. America's top general is firing back against Republican critics of the military's diversity efforts. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley, in answering a question said, I want to understand white rage, and I'm white. Here's ABC's chief Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl. America's top general today made an impassioned defense of the education that soldiers receive at West Point after Republican congressmen accused the military academy of embracing divisive theories on race, citing one class in particular. The seminar that over 100 cadets attended titled Understanding Whiteness and White Rage, taught by a woman who described the Republican Party platform as a platform of white supremacy. This is going on at West Point as we speak to our future military leaders. I do think it's important, actually, uh, for those of us in uniform to be open-minded and be widely read. And the United States Military Academy is a university. Uh, and it is important that we train and we understand. Uh, and I, I want to understand white rage. And I'm white. And I want to understand it. So what is it that caused thousands of people to assault this building and try to overturn the Constitution of the United States of America. What caused that? I want to find that out. He went on to say there's nothing wrong with studying controversial ideas. In fact, it's important. I've read Mao Zedong. I've read, I've read Karl Marx. I've read Lenin. That doesn't make me a communist. So what is wrong with understanding, having some situational understanding about the country for which we are here to defend? And I personally find it offensive that we are accusing the United States military, our general officers, our commissioned, non-commissioned officers of being, quote, woke or something else because we're studying some theories that are out there. Milley said it would be an especially bad idea to censor the study of America's troubling history on race, saying that understanding that matters to the discipline and cohesion of the military. Lindsay.
We saw Matt Gates there shaking his head. Our thanks to Jonathan Carl. As the country reopens more fully from the pandemic, there's one group of Americans who may not see the full benefits of getting the vaccine and its protections. Immunocompromised and immunosuppressed people who aren't able to produce antibodies even after being fully vaccinated. So how are they navigating reopenings and what can be done to protect them from the virus? Here's ABC's Ariel Reshef with this week's Vaccine Watch. Like most Americans, Maria Hoffman is eager to get back to pre-pandemic life. I've got friends that I want to see that I haven't seen just like everybody else, haven't seen in a long time. But like roughly 3% of Americans, Maria is immunocompromised. For people like Maria, their immune systems don't work like everyone else's, less able to defend the body against infections, either because of a specific disease that impacts the immune system or medications that suppress it. I don't look like I had a kidney transplant. If you walked walked by me down the street, you're never going to know. Maria is fully vaccinated, but because she is immunocompromised, that's not a sure protection against COVID-19. There's no guarantee of how long the antibodies from the vaccine are going to work for me. Researchers say that antibodies aren't the only indicator of levels of protection, as other parts of the immune system are also defending the body against infection. Think of antibodies as the tip of the immunologic iceberg, right? Antibodies are above the surface. We can measure them. But below the surface, there's a tremendous amount happening with B cell immunity, T cell immunity, and then trying to correlate all of that with protective immunity. But people that are immunocompromised or immunosuppressed live at a higher risk for infection than most. The issue isn't just that they're more, more vulnerable to COVID-19, they can be more vulnerable to any infection. And if your immune system is compromised, not only are you more susceptible to getting infected, but you may be more susceptible to having a more severe infection. Today, the pandemic is still far from over. Worldwide, there are nearly 7,000 deaths a day and over 10,000 new cases reported in the U.S. daily. But with over 65% of U.S. adults with at least one vaccine shot, 46 states have felt comfortable lifting their mask mandates and fully reopening, leaving some, like Maria, feeling left behind. It's nerve-wracking, to be honest with you, because how can I guarantee that I go into a building and, the whole, and everybody's been vaccinated? Researchers today are working to learn more about these vulnerable populations, but the studies are still in the early stages and too small for any definitive answers. This has been very painful for us to go through with our patients, many of whom were waiting with bated breath to get their vaccine so they could have their child go back to school or so that they could hug their grandchild. And then getting this news that you didn't have antibodies um, was sort of devastating to them. The COVID-19 vaccines have been tested heavily and are safe to use for the general population. But vaccines available in the U.S. have had little to no testing in immunocompromised individuals, something Dr. Spira and other researchers wanted to address early on. There was very little data about how patients with autoimmune diseases might fare with the vaccine. These researchers wanted to bridge that gap, testing how well vaccines worked among immunosuppressed people and suggesting that some types of medication seemed to interfere with normal antibody response. They say more research is needed. The most important studies are going to be the large, large, large studies, which are going to look at forgetting what antibodies say, what's happening, are these patients getting infected or not? Early data also suggests that some patients had more trouble than others developing antibodies. After a full two-dose series, only 50% of transplant patients would have any antibody at all. And that's in contrast to 100% of people with healthy immune systems. And even the 50% of transplant patients who get an antibody response don't have the same high levels of antibodies that people with healthy immune systems have. But there has been good news. In a study published this month involving 30 transplant patients, many of those that had poor responses to the normal amount of COVID vaccine doses improved their antibody response after a third dose. Either they will need additional doses, higher doses, some modification to their immunosuppression during dosing, or there may be some people who we just cannot get a good immune response 
with any of these approaches. The CDC and FDA are not recommending extra doses of the vaccine for anyone, but they say the vaccines are safe for immunocompromised people. I think the main takeaway point from this study is hope for immunosuppressed patients that we will ultimately be able to figure out how to get a good immune response. And experts say that if you're immunocompromised, the best thing you can do is get vaccinated because some protection is better than none. Researchers hope that further study will bring answers and an increased sense of safety for vulnerable communities. It just takes longer to understand the immune response in people with compromised immune systems versus what we already know about the immune response in people with healthy immune systems. Though there's no timetable for those answers yet, they can't come soon enough. You still need to act like the person standing next to you has something, you know, that you don't know about. For ABC News, I'm Ariel Reshev, tracking the vaccines. Our thanks to Ariel for bringing us that. And before we go tonight, our image of the day, the Pope meets Spider-Man. Well, we're actually told that it's a young man in costume, but that young man has been making children smile in pediatric hospitals across Italy. And today, he and the Pope shared a few words. The Pope received a Spider-Man mask as a gift. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Good night. Coming up in the next hour, we are staying on top of a few things. He was a software pioneer turned international fugitive, and tonight John McAfee is dead. What he was accused of in the days leading up to his body being discovered in a Spanish jail. And the new fight over eviction moratoriums with the roofs over so many heads hanging in the balance. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. Reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not replace us! Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We are monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. Five people were hospitalized with non-life-threatening injuries after a pedestrian bridge collapsed onto a busy Washington, D.C. highway. Images following the collapse show a truck crushed under the bridge, which appeared to have completely detached from a staircase and platform. Metal fencing and other debris covered one of the main highways in the city. Officials said the preliminary investigation shows a truck carrying diesel fuel may have collapsed with the bridge causing it to separate from its mooring. Software pioneer and international fugitive John McAfee was found dead in a Barcelona jail. As you may know, he was the creator of the McAfee antivirus software. His lawyer says that he hanged himself after learning that he would be extradited to the U.S. to face federal tax evasion charges. The 75-year-old was also accused of a scheme involving cryptocurrencies. And the Supreme Court ruled in a major free speech case involving when schools can enforce rules of 
conduct on social media. The case involves a high schooler who posted a vulgar message to Snapchat and was later suspended from cheerleading, accused of breaching the code of conduct. In an eight to one decision, the court said that school's authority to regulate student speech is highly limited in off-campus settings, including on social media. And next to those rare but troubling cases of heart inflammation in young people, a CDC panel tonight revealed that they have concluded there is a, quote, likely association between the vaccine and the inflammation. The FDA is now finalizing a new warning, and Eva Pilgrim has the details. Tonight, a CDC panel finding a likely association between the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines and a rare, mostly mild heart inflammation in younger people, but saying the benefits of getting the vaccine still outweigh the risk. While this association is concerning, know that a choice not to get a vaccine is not a risk-free choice, and it is a choice to take a much greater risk of, of not only of suffering or being hospitalized or dying from the virus, but of getting myocarditis. The experts pointing to a greater risk of heart inflammation from the virus itself Itself, but the FDA finalizing a new warning that will go out to health care providers and the public. Out of more than 26 million doses given to young people, the CDC confirming 323 cases of the condition after getting a vaccine, mostly in males. The good news is it's mild. It's short-lived, it appears to be self-resolving, and it's rare. 16-year-old Noah Hires was hospitalized with chest pain two days after getting the Pfizer vaccine. It went away within hours, but his doctors think the second dose may have caused temporary heart inflammation. I would definitely encourage everyone to get their children vaccinated, and I think Noah feels the same way. Yes. As far as we know, there is zero long-term effects from this, so 100% would still get the vaccine. Health officials saying vaccinating young people is the key to crushing this pandemic. Just a third of 18 to 24 year olds have been vaccinated. That age group now experiencing one of the highest rates of infection. Hospitals in Missouri are seeing it up close. We've been seeing much younger patients needing management within the hospital, um, some as young as their late teens, in their 20s, and their 30s, and unfortunately, all of those unvaccinated and very sick. The more contagious Delta variant now in at least 48 states, accounting for nearly half of all infections across parts of the West and Midwest. First Lady Jill Biden with country star Brad Paisley in Tennessee, making a push for the vaccine in the South where they are struggling to get shots into arms. <laughs> But when she revealed the numbers, the crowd wasn't happy. Only three in ten Tennesseans are vaccinated. And, well, you're booing yourselves. <laughs> the Delta variant giving the race to vaccinate new urgency. Experts warn if the country doesn't boost vaccinations, we could face a tough winter all over again. We don't have enough population immunity to stop the spread of this virus, and we seem to have hit a wall. So when the winter hits, you're going to see more suffering and more hospitalization and more death. And because children are particularly vulnerable, because they, many haven't been vaccinated, I think they will likely suffer greatly. Our thanks to Eva Pilgrim. President Biden is laying out his strategy to try to tackle the spike in gun violence across the country that we've been talking about for several months now. The announcement comes as he faces criticism over rising murder rates, and Congress continues to debate a comprehensive police reform bill. ABC's Elizabeth Schulze has the details. A renewed effort by the White House to address a spike in gun violence. Today, the department is announcing, as I just did, the major crackdown on stem the flow of guns used to commit violent crimes. President Biden outlining a strategy to curb rising gun violence, including cracking down on gun dealers who violate federal law and repurposing millions of dollars in state coronavirus relief funding toward police departments. The announcement comes amid repeated attacks from Republicans that the defund the police movement is behind a rise in violent crimes. It's impossible to ignore that these terrible trends are coming precisely as so-called progressives have decided it's time to denounce and defund local law enforcement. President Biden is also repeating his call for Congress to pass gun control laws amid a surge in mass shootings from Atlanta to Boulder to San Jose. We have an opportunity to come together now as Democrats and Republicans, as fellow Americans to fulfill the first responsibility of government on our democracy to keep each other safe. Enough.
Police department data shows it's mostly gun-related crimes on the rise. In seven out of the 10 largest cities in the U.S. in the past year, murder rates are up. Shooting incidents have increased 64% this year in New York, 51% in Los Angeles. But in many big cities, crimes like robbery and burglary are actually down in the past year. So the reality is there's more guns on the street. You have a, a really divided, angry population right now. Uh, the pandemic was over and there's just a lot of people out of work. So the stressor factors are pushing these numbers up. Our thanks to Elizabeth. And for more reaction to President Biden's announcement, we're joined now by Baton Rouge, Louisiana Mayor Sharon Weston Broom. Thanks so much for joining us tonight, Mayor Broom. Thank you, Lindsay. Now, your city, Baton Rouge, has seen just a 1% increase, but an increase nonetheless in violent crime during the pandemic. That's after crime had actually been trending down since 2017. What impact could the president's plan have on your community in particular? Well, we applaud the president for taking this initiative with his uh, community uh, intervention uh, plan uh, to help us with uh, violent crimes here in our community. Uh, I believe it will help us continue to stand up some of our community-based approaches to addressing uh, crime, such as our Safe, Hopeful, and Healthy initiative. And your police chief served on a roundtable with President Biden's team to address crime. Uh, what did he want the administration to know about what works or, or maybe doesn't work in, in Baton Rouge? I believe Chief Paul was there certainly to give voice uh, not only to uh, his efforts, strategic efforts in law enforcement, but to talk about the collaboration uh, that he has implemented with the community, with our community-based approaches, uh, such as uh, addressing issues in our, uh, with school intervention and, and uh, as well as making sure uh, that we are integrating the community into our public uh, safety equation. What do you feel that you need most from the federal government in your fight against violent crime? Well, this is certainly a great start. The uh, recognition, uh, the fact that uh, we have very philanthropic, uh, various philanthropic efforts that will be assisting us, as well as the ability to use some of our American rescue dollars uh, towards addressing crime. We've already started by using some of our CARES dollars at the end of last year uh, to do intervention efforts through our community. So, as a mayor, I I certainly greatly appreciate uh, the president's uh, initiative, and we're glad to be a part of this collaborative. Just want to follow up on that because you said it's a great start. Where would you like to see it go ultimately? Well, it's all about data. And of course, if once we see the numbers go down, we can see uh, the efforts uh, that have merged together from law enforcement as well as our community-based efforts. And then we can see that uh, this, this uh, merging of uh, our law enforcement with our community-based approach can certainly turn our cities around and reduce crime. So the dollars that we'll get uh, from the federal government, the technical assistance from uh, milli, many of the uh, nonprofits, uh, philanthropic organizations, I believe will help us uh, move this summer uh, down towards the number of uh, crimes we see in our community. Mayor Broom, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you, Lindsay. There is new talk surrounding a possible extension on the eviction moratorium that's circulating in our nation's capital today. This comes as millions of Americans may be faced with eviction notices as soon as next week when the order is set to expire. It's an issue that has several leading progressives urging the White House and the CDC to extend it. According to the Census Bureau, more than 7 million American households are behind on their rent, including nearly 4 million with children, with blacks and Latinos more likely to be struggling currently. Let's bring in ABC's Mary Alice Parks, who's been following this story and was in the White House briefing room today where she directly questioned the press secretary. Mary Alice, you wrote this week about Democratic lawmakers pushing the White House to extend this. What is the White House telling you? 
Yeah, Lindsay, I asked White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki about this, and she said ultimately it's a decision that the CDC will make. This eviction moratorium was put in place by the CDC as a COVID precaution. The idea that if families were evicted from their homes during the pandemic, they might start residing with, with relatives, with friends in more crowded households. So ultimately, the CDC will have the final stay here. But we're learning that the administration is really seriously considering at least a one-month extension. As you said, progressives are really pushing the White House to act on this. They say that people need more time to get their affairs in order, that this is a matter of health, racial, and economic justice right now, as, as the economy is still struggling to get back on its feet. But hasn't Congress already allocated money for emergency rental assistance? Why are progressive Dems saying that there's still a need for this? Yeah, that's true. Over $40 billion, in fact, has already been allocated in those recent COVID relief packages. But experts say it just took a lot of time for cities and states to set up programs to get that money to the renters that need it most. I talked to the legal aid services that work on housing here in D.C., for example, and they told me that they've had 20,000 applicants for that emergency rental assistance, but only about 2,000 applications have been processed. So there's 18,000 households households that are still waiting to hear if they're going to get some of that emergency funding. So again, the letter uh, from progressives, from Democrats said, just give everyone more time. It's in everyone's interest if more of that money from Congress gets to the renters who need it, who can pay back the landlords, who also need it. And what's the latest on the court cases challenging the moratorium? Yeah, there's a group of realtors from Alabama that, that went to court that said the CDC just didn't have jurisdiction here. They were out ahead of their skis. They didn't have a right to be doing this and putting these kind of eviction moratoriums in place. They had some victories in some lower courts, but then over 20 state AGs stepped in. They actually appealed to the Supreme Court and said, let's just take a minute. Please don't overturn this eviction ban. And so right now, there's sort of a pause. We're seeing the states really rally around this eviction ban for now. Mary Alice Parks, our thanks to you. Thanks. I'm not here to be anyone's slave. Those were the words today from one of the most famous people on the planet talking about pop superstar Britney Spears. She told a Los Angeles County judge that she is not okay, that she feels enslaved, traumatized, exploited, and controlled. She's been under a conservatorship for the past 13 years, her father and others controlling her finances and personal affairs, and now she wants out. ABC's Kaylee Hartung reports in from Los Angeles, where Britney Spears testified today in her conservatorship hearing. Tonight, Britney Spears dropping a bombshell in court, telling a judge, ma'am, I'm not here to be anyone's slave. She's requesting the conservatorship that's controlled her life and finances for 13 years be terminated without any further psychiatric evaluation. During a 30-minute call into the virtual status hearing, Spears describing how her court-appointed conservators, as well as her family members, have exploited her life, traumatized her, and even forced her into a care facility against her will. Spears saying as she cried to her father, quote, to hurt his daughter, 100,000 percent he loved it. Telling the judge at one point her therapist put her on the powerful medication lithium, making her feel drunk. But when she told her parents she was scared, she says her family did nothing. Since she stopped performing, Spears has stayed largely silent until now. Her Instagram, the only insight into her well-being over the last two years. Am I okay? Yes, I'm totally fine. But Spears saying today, I've lied and told the whole world I'm okay, but it's a lie. And we are joined now by Kaylee Hartung outside of the courtroom. Just stunning testimony today going into this hearing. We really didn't know what to expect exactly. No, we didn't, Lindsay, but jaws were on the ground out here as we were listening into this video conference that didn't have any video of Brittany, and we weren't allowed to record anything we heard because of the judge's ruling, so here we are trying to do our best we can to share with you what she said because that statement from her, it was explosive. It was last year that, that her counsel had requested a status hearing like this in order to remove her father from his role in the conservatorship, but today, the state that's been circled on the calendar are finally here, finally a chance to hear from Brittany herself. And, and we didn't know what to expect. We didn't know what specific issues she would bring up, but she made it very clear right out of the gate. She feels like this conservatorship is abusive, like it has taken over too much control of her life. You said it. She says, I deserve a life. The detail that she went into describing how scared she's been, how her family has done nothing to help her, how she's been embarrassed. It's, it was heartbreaking, quite honestly, to listen to the tone of her voice and the feelings that she can Conveyed the judge saying that she hears her 
Lindsay. And, and that's likely one of the things that she wanted was to be heard. We also heard uh, from the lawyer for Britney's father, Jamie. What was the response there? Yeah, right after this bombshell was dropped by Brittany, we heard from her father's attorney reading a very short statement on his behalf. He said he's sorry to hear that his daughter is in so much pain. Mr. Spears loves his daughter and misses her very much. That was all we heard from Jamie Spears' side. There was no rebuttal, no denial of anything that Brittany said, just that short, to the point apology. Now, uh, he is a co conservator along with Jody Montgomery. Jody Montgomery's counsel speaking up on behalf of the conservative saying they do disagree with some of the things that Brittany said, but said this is not the time or the place to take up those details. That will be discussed at a later date. Lindsay. And, and Brittany Spears has now made it very clear that she does not want to be a part of this conservatorship. So what happens next? And she doesn't want to be a part of this conservatorship, and she doesn't want any further psychiatric evaluation to be a part of the judge's determination of her future under this conservatorship. So, quite honestly, Lindsay, it's unclear what happens next. There was a lot of discussion of dates that need to be put on the calendar for the next hearing and the next and the next. It seems like this is just the beginning of a long process. This has already been 13 years of Britney Spears' life under the control of this conservatorship without her own control over her life and finances. You can only imagine. She wants this done expediently. The judge seeming to recognize um, the, the time sensitive nature here as Brittany made her pleas. But we heard dates need to be put on the calendar for future hearings, and none of those dates were decided today. But one of the big questions that will also need to be answered as we learn of those further status hearings, Lindsay, is will these hearings be public in any way? Like we were able to listen in today, there was an argument made by the conservatorship side that these should not be public, but we'll see. And Britney Spears sounded like she wanted it to be public again, wanting to get her words out there. And Kaylee, you were also outside of the courthouse today speaking with some of Britney's loyal fans. We saw those free Britney signs. Tell us about your conversations and their reaction. Yeah, Lindsay, every one of the people here supporting Britney today, you talk to them, they will tell you a story about how Britney Spears has impacted their life. I spoke to one young man who said, I've been a fan since day one, since I was seven years old. And he said, I'm not trying to exaggerate here, but she saved my life. He described dark times in his life where listening to his music helped pull him out of those holes. And he said, she saved my life. He said, this is how I can repay that debt to her, showing her my unending support. He said, we are not leaving until she is set free. And we never expected to get a ruling from the judge today, but, but you could hear the cheers out here, Lindsay, among the Free Britney movement gathered as she demanded an end to this conservatorship. She meant no words in saying how it's made her felt and the damage that it's done to her life. The people here today to support her want her free, and, and they were so pleased to hear her stand up for herself today and tell the judge exactly how she feels. Lindsay. And the fans there saying that they are in this for the long haul. Kaylee Hartung, our thanks to you. And still to come, the airstrike in Ethiopia claiming dozens of lives and the disturbing reports that medical help was prevented from coming in. And the new documentary looking at the struggles and the triumphs of singer Mary J. Blige. Stay with us. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. Powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Friday nights, 9 8 Central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime. 2020, Friday nights, 9 8 Central on ABC. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. 
Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart they did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not replace us! Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Welcome back. We are tracking several international headlines at this hour. More than 50 people are dead in Tigray after an airstrike hit a busy market. An official with Tigray's health bureau told the Associated Press that more than 100 other people were wounded, including children, and at least 33 people were still missing. The U.S. State Department released a statement where they said that they are aware of credible reports that security forces prevented medical personnel from helping victims. The department is calling the attack reprehensible and is calling for an immediate ceasefire. Office workers flocked to newspaper stands to buy a copy of the pro-democracy newspaper Apple Daily in Hong Kong on Wednesday after it announced that it would print its last edition tomorrow. Six staff members, including the editor-in-chief and opinion writer, were arrested last week under the national security law for allegedly colluding with foreign forces in their articles. The end of the popular 26-year-old tabloid has raised serious concerns over media freedom and other rights in the Chinese-ruled city. And now some happy news. Shin Shin, the giant panda at the Tokyo Zoo, gave birth to twins. This is the first birth in the last four years at the zoo. Shin Shin had been removed from public view since the zoo reopened from its pandemic closure after showing possible signs of being pregnant. Pandas are notoriously difficult to breed in captivity as the females only go into heat once a year and can be picky about their partners. Now to the legendary and iconic singer Mary J. Blige. It's been nearly 30 years since the queen of R&B's groundbreaking album, My Life, sparked a musical movement. A new documentary is turning the spotlight on her life, struggles, success, and healing, and what she calls that, why she calls that album one of her, her darkest times. ABC's Janae Norman got a chance to talk to her. I'm going down. It's the album that sparked a movement, My Life by Mary J. Blige. Sleep don't come easy. And nearly three decades later, the queen of hip hop and R&B is looking back in a new documentary on Amazon, Mary J. Blige, My Life. My Life is probably my darkest album. At one of the darkest times I've had. Why do you think that album still resonates with so many people all these years later? Because so many people are still hurting. A lot of people can relate to another person going through it, and you could feel it in the music. Is there a song on the album that you could listen to on repeat? The whole album I can listen to, but I can't listen to it on re repeat because it's just, at some point I will start crying. Now, not because I'm sad because I made it out of that. I made it, I, I could've, yeah. The triumph of it all is I'm, I'm alive to feel it. Like I'm no longer dying. Her sophomore release catapulted to the charts in 1994 and has reigned supreme as one of Rolling Stone's top 500 greatest albums of all time. This album was an anthem for so many people, but particularly for women struggling in relationships with family, through trauma, personal struggles. What does it mean to you to have it received that way? We're celebrating it from a positive perspective now. We're not 
crying and dying, you know, we're telling the story about how heavy and dark life was then. But it's, it's a celebration because we're here because, you know, I didn't want to live when I was doing it. You know, I just got to always credit God for, you know, using me <laughs> the way he did and allowing me to be a vessel to help women heal. Mary looks back on that road to healing, once paved by her past depression and suicidal thoughts. There's the scene in the documentary where you are listening to part of the album and you break down crying. Talk to me about what was going through your mind then. Just all the pain that I suffered. Ooh, excuse me. <clears throat> Just all the pain. Why is all this happening to me? And just the pain of that alone is what I was dealing with. Just why? Why, why do I have to suffer so much? I'm sorry. Oh, it's okay. Just pain, painful, painful hating yourself, painful not loving yourself. I just was bouncing, trying to survive, singing for my life, literally. And her musical success, a testament to her journey to self-love and survival. It's beautiful. It's the most beautiful thing to explore self-love for myself, to know that I have it, to be by myself as much as I am and like my company. It is amazing. I'm still in the healing process, but the, the heaviness of it is, is, is gone. Fill in the blank for me. Today, Mary J. Blige is strong. And hear that strength there. Our thanks to Janae for that. That is our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts.